The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 16th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, What will I do, now that my master is taking the position away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what, I, what to do, so that when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, How much do you owe my master? He answered, A hundred jugs of olive oil. He said to him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it fifty. Then he asked another, How much do you owe? He replied, A hundred containers of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill, and make it eighty. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. Whoever, whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much. And whoever is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful with a dishonest wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters. For a slave that will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in wealth. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. What are some iconic statues we think of in America? I'm sure the Lincoln Memorial in Washington comes to mind. The Statue of Liberty. Perhaps the Marine Corps Memorial with the raising of the flag on Iwo Jima. And for anyone who has been to New York City or watches financial news on TV, the Bronze Bull on Wall Street. I've taken issue with that bull statue in recent years, as it has come to symbolize the power and status of money. It has become in many ways the modern day equivalent of the golden calf that the Israelites worshiped in the desert as they were heading to the promised land. A false God that we put our faith and trust in, worshiping the almighty dollar instead of the almighty God. Martin Luther once said that John 3.16, For God so loved the world, was the gospel in a nutshell. I believe that the golden rule do to others as you would have them do to you, from the gospels of Matthew and Luke, is our mission in a nutshell. Treat everyone how you would want to be treated. Or as it is put in the greatest commandment from Jesus, love your neighbor as yourself. And I do mean everyone, all your neighbors, no matter where they are from, what they look like, what they believe in, who they love, and as today's readings tell us, what their socioeconomic status is. If it sounds like I'm about to get on my soapbox, you're probably right. But that's just the way today's readings are going. We start off in Amos which, as I've said before, my Old Testament professor liked to refer to as angry Amos. And it's very clear Amos is very angry, and he's directing it this week at the wealthy merchants who take advantage of the poor. Amos starts off with, Hear this, you that trample on the needy and bring ruin to the poor of the land. Clearly, Amos is mad. So mad that the word I would use cannot be said in church. 
Amos is sensitive to the injustices and evils that face the poor in this time and uses the wealthy's words against them when announcing God's judgment. When will the new moon be over so that we may sell grain and the Sabbath so that we may offer wheat for sale? We will make the uffa great and the small and the shekel great and practice deceit with false balances, buying the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and selling the sweepings of the wheat. However, the wealthy and powerful who control the marketplace don't really care about religious observance. The weekly Sabbath, the day when everyone, including slaves, gets to rest and take a break, is an inconvenience for them in their pursuit of wealth. The same with the celebration that starts the month, once these inconvenient festivals are over, the merchants can get back to business as usual, making the ephah, a unit of measurement for grain, small, and the shekel, a weight used to measure out silver or gold, heavy. In other words, they will, use, they will sell less grain for more money than it's actually worth. Not just that, they'll even mix in chaff and grain that has fallen to the ground in amongst the good grain which would be like adding sawdust to flour or diluting something with water and passing it off as pure. There are laws in the Bible that warn against such practices. Leviticus 19.36 You shall have honest balances, honest weights, an honest ephah, and an honest hin. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Catherine Schifferdecker from Working Preacher wrote in her commentary this week on the Amos text, Those who profess to follow the Lord, the God of Israel, are to reflect God's own character, which is one of justice and mercy for the poor, the widow, the orphan, and the foreigner. Sabbath rest is for everyone, not just the wealthy landowners or the heads of households, but for the slave the foreigner, the children, and the poor. Simply observing the Sabbath is not enough if the justice and mercy exemplified by the Sabbath does not shape everyday life, one's behavior at work, school, the mall, and on the street. And that brings us to today's Gospel from Luke in the parable of the dishonest manager. There are many ways to look at this parable, especially the role of the shrewd manager. How many of you would think that the manager was the bad guy in the story? That is the first thing that we go to because he was being dishonest with his master's money. But we really don't know the details of how he was being dishonest. Nonetheless, when he found out he was being fired, he goes to the people who owe his master and decides to cut their debts as a way to gain favor. We don't know if the manager had inflated the debts, only cut out what his commission would have been, but I'm inclined to give him the benefit of the doubt, that he saw a chance to help people before he got fired. The manager put others ahead of money, and even if he was sacrificing his commission, he still wasn't thinking about the money. The real lesson comes at the end of the gospel no slave can serve two masters for a slave will either hate the one and love the other or be devoted to the one and despise the other you cannot serve god and wealth the verse right after that that is missing makes it even better the pharisees who were lovers of money heard all this and they ridiculed him Yep, the people who hated Jesus the most were the most offended by what Jesus had to say. But Jesus is right. You cannot serve God and serve money at the same time. Because what happens is money usually wins out in the end. Money becomes that golden calf that replaces God. And with this false, go false God comes the false gospel of prosperity gospel. This is the popular movement where those preachers will tell us that if we just believe hard enough and do enough good we'll be blessed with wealth 
that isn't how our God is. We are are rewarded with eternal life, not wealth and power that that we desire. That false gospel sets up the idea that those who lack wealth are that way because they also lack belief, which goes against everything Jesus ever taught us. Remember, the wealthy and powerful in Jesus' time were the Pharisees and the scribes. Now, this isn't to say that money is evil, because it inherently is not. Money is a tool, a means to do something. A great example of this happened a few years ago during the pregame show for an Iowa State football game. A fan was holding up a sign saying his beer supply was running low and was asking people to send him money via Venmo so he could buy more beer. The sign went viral. And soon he was getting thousands of dollars. He realized he didn't need that much, nor did he want to just pocket it. He announced he was going to donate it to the Steed Family Children's Hospital, which overlooks Iowa State's home field. Not long after, Venmo and Enheiser Bush each said that they would match that donation. He raised over $38,000 by himself. And with the matches, it totaled to 115000 All for the children's hospital. Money only becomes evil when the purpose for it, which is used, is bad, or it becomes the center of everything we do. The reason for our existence. This is why Amos was angry. Because he saw how the merchants were taking advantage of the poor just so they could earn more money and were grumbling about their religious obligations getting in the way of making more money. The almighty God was not as important to them as the almighty dollar. This was one of the many things Jesus led us away from. It's one of the reasons he turned over the tables of the money changers in the temple. If we put God first and worship God only and not money, everything falls into place. If we care less about money, we are more likely to treat others with the respect and dignity they deserve. The way that Jesus did And wants us to do likewise. Treat others the way you want to be treated. Love your neighbor as yourself. And as we sit in the psalm today, the Lord takes up the weak out of the dust and lifts up the poor from the ashes. As God has done, so shall we. We need to lift up the weak, those that are seen as the outcast, the stranger, the foreigner, the ones who don't have as much as we do. And it becomes easier when we put the good book ahead of the pocketbook. Amen.